Yeah, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for Rafael and Daniel to organize this, uh, this track. It's a good, great pleasure to be here and to be represented as the International Lego Organization. I have some colleagues here in the room as well, so please, any complicated technical question, you might address them to them, to, to me. Huh? So, so the presentation today is basically a summary of uh, a lot of research that we have been doing in the, in the team, in, in my team, but also in the research department and in some other teams at the, at the International Labor Organization, trying to summarize a bit what we believe to know about uh, the future of work. As you might know, uh, the ILO has uh, just finished its centenary last year with uh, a lot of activities around uh, future of work uh, issues. And uh, we had a global commission on the future of work that also uh, came out with some recommendations. So some of this is reflected here. Some of this is maybe a bit more controversial and I'm really happy to look for, I'm looking forward to some of your reactions on, on, on these ideas. So I want to start with some take home messages that gives you basically the summary of, of all that, uh, what, what we are trying to, uh, to, to um, uh, discuss today. And the first of all is the solo paradox is kicking and well alive. So for those of you who don't know what the solo paradox is, it's, it's a famous uh, uh, economist, Nobel Prize winner Robert Solo, who used to say in the 80s already that uh, you can see uh, the ATMs in the uh, everywhere but in the statistics, meaning that you actually don't see much of the technological pro progress in terms of our incomes and, uh, and, and our well-being. And the question is, has that changed? And the answer to that, I'll show you in a minute, is for the moment at least not so much. Um, the, the, the link to that, to, to AI in particular, is that these techno new technologies are actually unlikely to lead to massive job losses. There will be trans uh, transforms, and new skills are necessary for sure, and we see already uh, uh, some of this happening. Not necessarily technical skills, uh, that's the interesting part of it. Um, and uh, um, and the, the, the reason for that is that there is actually a category of jobs uh, that David Graeber uh, used to call bullshit jobs uh, that might actually be the ones that are actually taking, taking the brunt of all the those people who might lose their jobs in the future. Um, what the key message is, and I think that's number five here on this list, is they, uh, the inequality is the big uh, hit of the of these new technologies. The inequality is on the rise. It's already on has been already on the rise over the last 30 years. And with AI, with the data economy, it's actually increasing further. And the question is what to do with that. I give you some some suggestions. Obviously, the policy answers is something else to uh, it's not necessary for us to discuss. Uh, and then I think one one key point as well, and that's coming in the debate uh, right now, is that the, there are ecological limits to what AI can actually uh, how far AI can actually go, and that will constrain some of the changes that we that we're going to see. Now, let me start with some uh, key, uh, nice, colorful charts here. Um, the first thing is, why do we actually talk so much about AI? Is, well, for, for one reason is that AI has been around, as you know, since the, at least the 1940s or 50s. Um, uh, Turing was one of the first to, to contribute to this discussion and what, what actually would, would uh, requ what a machine require to be considered to be equivalent to a human intelligence. What we have seen in the past is that this uptake in terms of, of uh, patents, of automation patents, has really focused increasingly on, uh, on artificial intelligence uh, patents. So in, since the 2000, let's say, uh, tens, like the mid-2010s, we see an enormous uptake in, in terms of patents around artificial intelligence, something that we haven't been seeing before. And we have some research on this to explain why, why what, what is behind this. But clearly, that's basically what's driving currently uh, our concerns and our, um, uh, our interest in, in the topic. As I said before, for the moment, we don't see much in terms of the statistics. So these are aggregate statistics for ag labor productivity uh, for some G7 countries. You can expand that. We have done some work also from emerging economies. What you actually see is that over the long term, since the 1950s, we gradual decline. So these are these are decade averages. You can you can smooth it out if you want, or you can just present it the yearly averages as well. But more or less, the 2010s is really I mean after the great. Great Depression, uh, sorry, after the Great Recession in the 2008-2009, what we see is labor productivity is essentially zero in most in most advanced economies, and even in those economies that are considered to be front, uh, um, catching up with the frontier, like China, um, uh, the, the, even there the labor productivity is declining rapidly, still obviously much higher than here. Um, there was a bump in the road, if you want, if you see that in the 1990s, uh, mainly to the, the third industrial revolution around ICT and, and uh, the implementation of some of these new technologies in logistics, but uh, since then uh, the, the declining trend has continued. And so we don't actually see much. What we do see is, and, and I think that's, uh, that's what's interesting, that AI is more than automation. Uh, and people increasingly realize that the automation uh, aspect of it is just one part of it. We can, um, and I mean, I see that Professor Otto is in the room, so that's really great to, to have, have you, you on this as well. Uh, we see that um, 
the, the, the idea that occupations are kind of made up of a range of tasks that are affected differently by, uh, by these AI uh, improvements or these the technological improvements. And we see that depending on what kind of combination of uh, computerization or automation and transformation of the job will de de depend very much on the, on the composition of the task for each occupation. Uh, so there, I'm, I've listed here some, I'll show you a graph in a minute, but this, uh, this is basically b uh, based on work from Frank Fossen and, and Andreas Sockner from the University of Reno, uh, uh, in Nevada, University of Nevada and Reno. And they just basically used um, two metrics. One is the Fry and Osborn uh, computerization risk, and then there's the Felton and Al uh, indicator of, uh, of uh, transformative, the transformative nature of, uh, of AI for certain tasks. And depending on the extent to which automation or, or transformation is important, you see different tasks being affected differently, some actually being improved. So you see an improvement in terms of the productivity or in terms of the, the quality of work that you're doing. And I would say most of us here sitting in the room, we are actually one of those who are benefiting a lot from this. But then there are other job occupations there where, where the, the, the automation, the potential for automation is much higher and the transformation actually much lower. When you apply this to uh, US uh, occupational data, you can see this nice uh, polarization picture, which is basically just a reflection of the discussion that had been happening earlier on. These are uh, 740 occupations. I just presented here the, the 10 largest on the, on the list at this side. And you see that, so there is a group of occupation on your right, which is basically the, those occupations are most likely to be disappearing or substantially reducing. And then there is the group of occupation on the left where, where the reduction, the automation potential is not that uh, large, but where the transformative nature of the, of the of of AI is, is much larger. And you see that uh, roughly, I would say that um, the two parts, the two sh uh, gray uh, shaded areas are more or less uh, same size, obviously, with the, with the question to what extent those who are disappearing can actually move to the other part of the, of the chart. Huh? If you apply that same method to emerging economies, you see that actually in that, in that quadrant called uh, machine terrain uh, occupation, there is a large group of occupation you'll see there. And so in emerging economies, actually the risk of job disruption and uh, disappearance of a large part of jobs is actually much larger. We have done some work on this in terms of robotization in the past, and we can actually see that the employment effect in, in emerging economies is much larger, uh, so in terms of the number of jobs, than in, in advanced economies. Now, uh, Michael Webb, a student and a PhD student in Stanford, has gone a step further and actually looked into the transformative nature of the type of transformation that's going to happen in, within different occupations. And he has categorized some, uh, some patent uh, uh, on, on AI with, uh, uh, using this type of keywords here on, on, your, on your left. And you can actually see what's interesting is that a lot of these keywords apply not so much to uh, routine type of jobs, but actually to jobs that require quite a, quite a high level of skill content. Huh? So, so the, the, the question is, are there, is there something coming now in terms of AI that might actually affect also the high skill occupation that we, we thought in the past would actually be relatively uh, safe from, uh, from jobs, uh, from, from job disruption. Uh, so you see that the, the, uh, the uh, three, uh, two bars at the right uh, that are mostly affected or that indicate uh, how much uh, these new patents are being affecting these jobs is uh, requiring bachelor or even higher high level uh, university degrees. Huh? So the question then becomes clearly what is happening with these jobs? Are they really disappearing or is there, or is there just kind of a complementary uh, effort and, and transformative effort uh, occurred along these, um, along these AI patents for this type of occupations? Huh? So this brings me to um, to my to my bullshit chart, uh, uh, bullshit jobs chart, which is uh, David Graeber made this this interesting point, saying, well, actually, what we are really seeing is a lot of jobs are disappearing. People move to jobs that that are of non in, no interest whatsoever. People are actually questioning what they're doing. What you do see, indeed is that there is a rise in administrative uh, jobs in a lot of, in a lot of sectors. Uh, so here, this is data for the, uh, for the healthcare sector in the, in the US, and you see that a lot of, uh, a lot of cost pressures in the, in the healthcare sector in the US, and actually that's also true for Switzerland, is in the administrative and the compliance personnel. So these are jobs that are there for legal reasons, for regulatory reasons, but, and, uh, and they are unlikely to be uh, automatized, simply because the regulation changes so fast that no machine can possibly uh, learn uh, fast enough to, to replace that in anticipation of what might come. Nevertheless, and that's actually what is, what is here uh, uh, shown on this, on this other chart, uh, in terms of are there a rise, are these, are there, uh, this, will there be a rise in, for instance, the gig economy as a response to that? 
we don't see that. And that's, that's data from the BLS. Again, we, our colleague who is currently doing a presentation, I think, next door, uh, she also did, uh, does some work on, on the rise of the gig economy. But the, the, the limitation here in terms of what this new work, this new uh, world of labor actually might mean, we don't, we don't see that that is actually an, uh, a, a growing occupation. What, what you do see is the occupation in terms of certain occupations, certain administrative personnel, whether it's healthcare, whether it's uh, real estate, uh, business services, etc. You, you see that there's a large uptake, but in terms of, of the gig economy, not so much. So is there really an, up, an increase in, uh, in bullshit jobs? I think the jury is still out, and the question obviously becomes whether this is... Um, this, whether this process of AI being disruptive also for high skill occupation is really going, uh, going forward uh, as, we, as we expect for the moment. What we do see, and I think that's not something which is particularly new, but it's just a, a continuation uh, trend of the past, is that an increase in equality is very likely. Huh? So what is interesting here is this, uh, this, um, this a chart that we had already published some, some years ago, and, and in, in principle you should uh, you would see if you extend that further beyond 20, 2012, you would see similar trends. What you see is as, as the cost of digitalization declined with the, in the blue dashed line, the number of jobs being dis destroyed actually declined as well. Obviously, there's no correlation whatsoever. The, the one has more to do with, dem with, with demographics than with, with digitalization. No? But what did increase was in inequality, and, with, and the uptake in inequality is actually continuing. There's some, there's some debate to what extent labor, labor income shares incre increasing or, or not, um, uh, but the Gini coefficient certainly has remain, uh, is higher and has remained relatively high, including in, in advancing economies and including in those countries who have actually a very, relatively well-developed social protection system like Switzerland, like uh, France, like, uh, like Germany. Why, where does it come from? So one of, one of the key aspects in this is, is really the, the way the data economy works and the way this, the, 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 um, the, um, the current system of uh, uh, creating network effects around a small, uh, a small number of big companies uh, uh, that manage to appropriate the, the rents of the data economy uh, helps the, to kind of amass this huge amount of, of, uh, of income. Uh, if you see the latest news uh, about uh, stock, uh, stock market valuation, uh, Google, Amazon, uh, I think it's Google, Amazon, and Apple now have reached the billion mark. Uh, so that's, that's just a reflection of that kind of network effects in this, in this small number of companies. And the question is, what do we do and what do we need to do? Or what, what are the possibilities to, to actually address that? One of them is data portability. Possible. There is there's the discussion around data commons. Actually, for those of you who are interested, tomorrow and on Friday, there's a discussion at the ITU, the International Telecom Union, Union in, in Geneva, exactly on, the, on data commons. The other thing is having more open innovation system. Um, the question is, do we actually, do we have the possibility to uh, to uh, grant patents to um, to AI for the moment, the, the, the patents is is on the data. It's not the patents; the copyright is on the data, but not on the on the AI tool as such. Um, and then the last one, the more the more let's say uh, controversial idea, is to have data as labor. So for everybody who who is actually contributing to these machines to these machine learning programs by providing his or her data, this data should in principle be remunerated. And that's again where this data commons idea comes in. And more closely related to the labor market, obviously there is a lot of discussion going on on how to ensure just transitions, especially for those people who need to shift from, switch from one, from one occupation or one task to, to another. Um, the question is how to, uh, how to ensure this, how to kind of ensure that governments have a sufficient amount of um, uh, of resources to, uh, to help with these transition processes. Uh, France has introduced, as you know, digital taxation uh, recently, uh, highly controversial. The question is, can we extend that? Is there, is there an agreement? The OECD is currently working on this. Um, other ideas include sovereign data wealth funds, so where actually governments would invest in some of these big companies rather than investing uh, in, uh, um, in more traditional industries, as they do in Norway, as they do in the Netherlands, is currently discussion, and as they do in Dubai, who is one of the leading uh, investment funds in, in this area. Um, one of my colleagues has proposed some digital social security, especially for the gig workers, and I think that's a, that's a key, uh, key area where more needs to be done, that these people are properly protected, and there are some suggestions, some policies recommendation that still need to be implemented. And then obviously, especially within these big uh, data companies, uh, stronger wage and profit sharing uh, uh, or stronger wage negotiation and profit sharing to ensure that some of these 
is huge benefits, which in principle are windfall benefits if you want to uh, uh, need to uh, are more broadly shared across across the economy. My last point is, and that's uh, that what I ended up in my take home messages is then actually growth speeds efficiency when it comes to AI. As you know, AI is actually extremely inefficient uh, from an energy consumption standpoint and extremely inefficient uh, technology simply because it's silicon based and not uh, not biological based. And the, and the question is to what extent we will reach a limit to what we can actually develop. Um, if you think about AI, uh, if you think about autonomous cars, for instance, um, the, the, in all likelihood, a fully autonomous car would in, require so much uh, energy that you have to put a nuclear power plant inside the car, which is obviously something that's at least for the moment not technically feasible. Huh? So, so, so here the question becomes to what extent we actually see uh, some natural limits because of the, the nature of the technology. Obviously, everybody is looking forward to quantum, uh, quantum computing, but we are not at the stage yet where we can actually implement this uh, at a, at a, at a stage where... Um, um, where we can have miniaturized uh, versions of it. So, so here the the issue is really that the the, the growth that is this tech, the, the growth of this technology is so strong for the moment that it will have an ecological footprint that is uh, at some point not no longer negligible. I think for the moment we're talking about six percent of electricity consumption in the U.S. is being beaten, taken taken up by uh, by computing devices, and that's likely to rise obviously with consequences for climate change, as we just heard last, last week in, in Davos. And I leave you with that little chart from Dilbert uh, with the question is, should we actually do, do, are we actually automating uh, jobs that we shouldn't have done in the first place? Thank you very much. <laughs>, so I mean, this is, I mean, as you know, this is not necessarily my definition. I mean, this is David Graeber who came, came up with this. In his, in his mind, the bull chip jobs are basically those jobs that are, uh, where people actually themselves do not understand why they're doing this type of jobs. Huh? Um, and I mean, okay, you might actually question this for us as well. I mean, I, I mean, I, we question this ourselves that sometimes. <laughs> But uh, but but I think I think the the key issue here is and I mean I give you another example from from a discussion I have with a friend of mine who has an accountancy uh, uh, um, firm and I've asked him exactly that question are you actually afraid of AI taking all your jobs and he said well I have the problem that I actually can't find enough accountants because the regulation changes so quickly that no machine can possibly uh, catch up with all these changes so so you will have actually this type of uh, quasi legal jobs. That that need to be done uh, or in, uh, that that require idiosyncratic tasks or that, that, that to to perform idiosyncratic tasks linked to the to latest regulation. There's a lot of things that you can routinize, and that's probably what's done already. But a lot of things you cannot do because the things change so quickly. And I mean, if you see if you see in any bureaucracy, the amount of the amount of bureaucrat bureaucratic over, uh, uh, overhead that is coming and that is continuously growing is enormous. So actually, whatever, what I mean, if I take up my own job, if whatever benefit I get from from any computing improvement in terms of doing faster statistics. Etc. Is, beat, is eaten, being eaten up by the fact that I have at the same time spent to spend much more time on uh, uh, complying with internal regulation, and I think that's that's what is behind this idea of the the rise of the bullshit jobs. Not so, not that the number of of these jobs would increase, but the size, uh, um, the the, the task, the, the intensity of the task will, will probably increase along this along this lines. So. More questions, comments, please, yes. Okay, a uh, comment or an objection that maybe um, the creative jobs are kind of automation proof. So I'm a data scientist, but I'm also a professional musician, and I would strongly object to the to the classification of job as a musician as having low risk of automation and and being outsourced to machines. Um, I give you a following example. Basically, professional musicians they give uh, they they get much of their income by playing. Music, for example, in restaurants, so giving this kind of background music, uh, and also giving lessons. And both of these tasks can be very easily automated, especially now, for example, with the deep learning. You can have a model which actually produces very pleasant background music, which has no copyright, it has no human, there is no 
No human issues, you just order a service. You, you could imagine a service, you just order an abonnement with a deep learning music uh, generation service. And basically, you just um, kick out the whole group of professional musicians out of their jobs. And the same with teaching. I mean, you could have a, like a smart uh, teaching app that basically listens to the progress that you make, gives a small adjustment, pretty much everything that on a not professional level, everything that an amateur would like to get from a, from a human teacher. So I think, uh, I mean, we may, I, I think my, my, main, my main point is uh, we may think that some jobs are actually automation proof, but this may very well not be the case. And yeah, if someone has some comments, I'll be happy to discuss. Yeah. Thank you. I give on the, 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 the mic to the next person. I would just, I'd like to ask you, wouldn't you say that people want to hear you exactly perform, but not the computer playing your song or some of his songs, actually? I mean, most of, most of the situations that an average person would reach for music is not because they are ready for a music experience. I mean, music exper experience means you actually have a, some kind of recording or a musician and you sit down and you listen. This is not the typical situation that the music is used now. Now it's kind of a silence filler. It's a background noise in a restaurant. It's like a pleasant experience that uh, accompanies your shop experience and you don't need a musician for this. Not at all. Yeah. Another uh, question, so I collect them and you have your, the last word, Eka. Well, I mean, for, for your example, you can also have a CD playing, radio. I mean, it's, you don't need AI to do that. And basically, I think it's a, it's a prevalue to have like a band playing. And I'm, I think most of the people, when they're learning something, they want to have a human that can motivate them and everything. And I, we can see that with a MOOC. There's a lot of MOOC where you can learn to program or any, everything, but it's not the same experience as having a teacher that is here to, accompany, uh, to help you doing things. So I think in, in a sense, it can replace partially the job, but there's not uh, all the competencies that can be replaced. Kind of. Are there other questions? Also, other subjects, if you want? <laughs> no? So. Please, Eckhart, what do you say to this? No, I mean, thank you very much. I mean, I guess the, the real issue about this is, and you, you, you are absolutely right to point this out, that all of these uh, indicators that also I presented at the beginning obviously rely on some kind of expert guesses of what could be or could not be uh, automatized. And what actually will be automatized is an economic decision at the end. It's not a technological decision. I think that's also something we have learned a lot in the debates uh, uh, over the recent years. And and I think, I mean, somebody said this uh, afterwards, it's, it's actually absolutely true. A lot of these uh, social I mean, sorry to say this, it's not a social job. You wouldn't probably con consider it as a social job, but it's, it's, a, it's a social interaction, if you want. Music, playing music, being, I mean, even healthcare can be uh, automatized to a certain extent. I mean, we are seeing also, in Japan, we have seen this movement towards robotization of, of nurses, you know, and do we actually want to have that? That's something that will depend very much on whether people want to have this type of services uh, in, in a robotized version or not. And I think that's something we, we really have to see. I guess my answer to this is always that you will, as a, as a human being, as a human intelligent being, you will always find a specific edge to what you bring in addition to the machine. And I think whatever the machine can do, and I mean, this, the example of the CD is absolutely correct, whatever the machine can do, you will always bring something, some specific experience. You don't want to necessarily hear only a CD playing. You want to have this live experience, somebody playing actually music. You want to have a live experience with a doctor. You don't want to have a machine telling you. That, that doesn't mean that that cannot improve the, the productivity of doctors, given that we actually have a shortage of, of some of these high skill jobs. So I think for me, as I said, the technological potential is clearly there, whether it will be implemented or not, is, is to a large extent an, an economic decision and a decision of to what extent our demand for this type of services will, uh, will stay the same or even increase. But thank you for your question. <laughs>